Why don't we get started? It's a little after 7 o'clock. First, I want to thank you all for coming to our Ward 4 Ward Meeting Town Hall. This is the sixth one we've held around the city. So obviously there are three to go, one in every ward. Uh, so I, I really appreciate your interest and your involvement in the city, and thank you for coming. Now, we also have some other public officials who are here. Tom Lopez, so-called local politician, you can tell from his hats. <laughs> ward 4, Alderman, as well as Manny Espitia, who's a Ward 4 state rep. So I want to thank them for coming. Now, usually, so, and what we'll do is I'll make a, I'll tell you a few things that are going on in the city, particularly with respect to Ward 4, this neighborhood. And then uh, we're going to hear a short presentation from Deb Chisholm about the riverfront, which of course is in Ward 4, and some of the improvements we're trying to make there. And then we will take your questions, your comments, anything that you'd like to, anything you'd like to discuss. Um, so down at City Hall, we, we work on a lot of things at the same time. Maybe I should introduce Sean Nelson from PAL. Uh, he works very hard in, in the, the Three Streets neighborhood at PAL, so we really appreciate everything that he's doing. The, the city works on a lot of things at the same time, trying to create jobs, economic growth, trying to build a, tax, a stronger tax base, making sure that we have excellent education at every school every day, like here at Ledge Street. We expanded public kindergarten to full day for all elementary schools a couple of years ago. And we're looking at a major upgrade of our middle schools, starting with either the restoration or the replacement of Elm Street with a new school, and an expansion and improvement of the other middle schools at the same time. Hopefully we get a curriculum upgrade then. An example of some of the things we're trying to do in the schools. This last budget that passed added four ELL teachers. English is a second language, basically, to make sure that the people, the many students that we have in our schools, don't, uh, who do not speak fluent English yet, can be taught fluent English so that they can participate fully in all, all other classrooms. We have worked particularly hard on downtown housing both some affordable, so, some so-called workforce housing, like the, like the Marshall Street, East Hollow Street project, we call it Marshall Street, uh, other market rate housing, such as... <laughs> he turned it off when he put it in his pocket. <laughs> and we have been televising these because we find that people who don't come would like to he hear what's going on, and so... Uh, at this, at, at various people have suggested we try to televise it, so we've done a f three or four, by, and we will put this on the uh, city city channel. So we've done the, we've seen the uh, Franklin Street mill to housing conversion, which has gone very well, uh, and there's another project over by the river, Riverfront Landing, and we've got other smaller and some larger projects I in the works. So that has been a focus. But here in Ward 4, there are a couple of issues that we definitely want to uh, focus on and discuss a little bit tonight. One is the Safe Stations program, which, uh, there, which uh, allows any person who wants help with a, any kind of an addiction to show up at any fire station 24, 24 hours, seven days a week. And a firefighter conducts an initial interview uh, an, a brief intake interview, and then AMR does the same thing, that's the ambulance company, and then within 10 to 11 minutes that person is transported to either Harbor Homes or what is now called the hub in the new hub and spokes uh, state system in order to get treatment. And 11, uh, excuse me, around 3,000 people have reported to the fire station since we opened this in November of 2016. And these, this, th every two weeks we get these reports that are created by Amer uh, AMR and they compare all of the figures going back to 2015. So 
3,000 people have come to safe stations in the last almost two years, one and three quarters years. Uh, and we see, it seems clear that we are making progress with respect to the opioid crisis, what we call the opioid crisis, a public health crisis here in Nashua. Because the latest statistics show that there is a 17% decrease in overall overdoses and a 23% decrease in fatal overdoses as compared with last year. Last year being, of course, 2018. And 2018 was considerably lower than 2017. So we are trending very well. Now, this doesn't mean that we've solved this problem by any stretch of the imagination, because any one overdose, one fatality is too many, but at least we're pushing it in the right direction. At the same time, Manchester is conducting a similar program, but it has made some progress, but is struggling with it a little more, at least according to the current statistics. Manchester has seen a decrease in total overdoses, but an increase as compared with last year in fatalities. So we believe the program we've put together here is working effectively and will continue to do so unless this, unless uh, the state does something to compromise the program with this hub and spokes approach that will uh, result in a less effective response. Uh, so I want to, you know, the fire department has done a great job with it. Certainly we meet every two weeks to discuss it and discuss exactly what's going on. One thing that came up today and we did meet today is that there was a situation in Appleton, Wisconsin, where a person had an overdose on a public bus. Police fire came and, or at least the fire department came and administered Narcan, which brings someone back from an OD. And the person uh, was armed and apparently was wanted by the police and, and got up and in the end, uh, with the police present, shot a member of the fire department and I think killed a member of the fire department and there was a subsequent you know, uh, exchange of gunfire. Now we've had nothing like that here. The safe stations program, of course, is better for the firefighters in the sense that firefighters have been responding to that type of overdose call in a bus, on a, in someone's apartment, in a public restroom, on a street for years. And when you bring someone out of an OD, uh, oftentimes they're thankful, but a lot of times they're not. And that sometimes they're not happy and they get, get more aggressive, and that's what happened in Appleton. When people come to the Safe Stations program, they are seeking help. They're looking for help. They're not, something's not happening that they don't like. They're looking for help. They usually bring a family member, and it is a much more positive experience for a firefighter to encounter someone in that situation than, uh, than uh, an OD at a strange location. So we're going to try to guard against this risk. We're going to have a meeting of, not, we've never had anything like that, but we're going to guard against this risk by having a meeting with the police and try to work out some sort of protocol so we can determine who might be armed bef you know, before uh, they're in a position to, to cause any harm. But we always want to improve the program, but we think we are making progress in that regard. Another thing that uh, uh, we have here in Ward 4 that we're working on, and Sandy is very familiar with this, is the Mohawk Tannery site, which is a polluted site that has been in the city for a long time. So the EPA has come and proposed a public-private partnership uh, to try to pay for that cleanup. And the, they have been working uh, with a private developer who is developing a plan to encapsulate, basically, most of the, uh, encapsulate the pollution that's on the site. Uh, there's an EPA approved solution. The developer has uh, proposed something very similar, as I understand it, from, to the EPA solution. And now, after some delay, that has been put out to bid. 
So uh, the design solution that the developer has put together, uh, which has come in in the last week or two, is now going to go out to bid to see what it might cost to implement this solution. Because, the question, because there is some wide disagreement uh, in terms of the opinions as to what this might cost. So we hope that when we get, these, get the, the bids in, working with the EPA and with the developer, we can develop a financial plan that would result in a cleanup. But it's hard to say what that would be at the moment. EPA is willing to contribute some funds. We don't know exactly how much. The developer is willing to contribute funds, and certainly the city is willing to devote at least part of the tax revenue that would be generated by a development uh, to pay for the cleanup. It's not even clear what exactly the developer is going to put there, but it's probably some, some number of residential units and possibly some commercial units out near the Broad Street Parkway. So we are looking to see what these bids are going to be so we can start to talk about uh, something specific. Now you're going to hear from Deb, Ch Deb Chisholm, who also is very knowledgeable about the cleanup. Deb is right over here. She's our river specialist and our environmental specialist. Uh, she's here. She can, of course, answer, may, may have more details uh, as regarding, at least technical details regarding the, the Mohawk Tannery situation. But she's going to give you a short presentation on what we're trying to do on the riverfront. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to mention that by working together as a community, we think we have you know, we think we have a great place to live. Certainly, we always want to make it better, but we want to make this a wonderful place to live for the people who are here, but also for anyone who might come, decide to come to Nashua. So I thought I would run through quickly some recent accolades that the city has gotten. So in 2018, Nashua was named one of the safest places to retire in the country. 2018, Nashua was named one of the best ninth run, ninth best run city in the country. 2018, Nashua was named the best place for millennials in Hillsborough County. 2018, Nashua was named the no, mo, most diverse and most inclusive place to live in New Hampshire. In 2018, Nashua, uh, it was said that it was decided that Nashua has some of the, the least amount of crime in a, mis, in a mid-sized city. We know we've always been very safe at least as compared with other cities of our size. In 2017, Nashua and Manchester were named one of the happiest places in the country, which is great. In 2017, Nashua was named the safest city in, a, in the country in another survey. And in 2017, Nashua was named one of the best cities to live in America. So, uh, I think this is due to what everybody is doing. We have wonderful Nonprofits and uh, that are like PAL that are working very hard for the for the people of the city. We have a school system that I think is delivering excellent results for kids. We the city government is working hard, but we have a group of citizens and residents who are very engaged in the city, doing a lot of volunteer work, very enthusiastic downtown, providing all kinds of activity for as an example, but also the nonprofits who are working to help dis more disadvantaged citizens. So across the board, I believe we're doing a great job and as a result of a group community effort. In any event, why don't we go ahead and listen to Deb's discussion of the riverfront and then uh, maybe we'll ask Tom if he has anything to add and then take your questions, your comments, anything that you'd like to uh, talk about. I don't know how the logistics are going to work on this. Thanks for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Um, so Sarah told me I had like an hour and a half um, to be She's able joking. To That's a joke. <laughs> Three minutes. OK. Um, OK. It's, well, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the, uh, the master plan for the downtown riverfront. Um, it's been going on for years. Um, back when I originally worked for the city, when Kathy Hirsch was here, uh, the majority of the trail was put through. Um, 
2016 rolls around, Mayor Donchus is on board and has asked community development and other departments to pull together and to keep moving on this, on this uh, riverfront redevelopment. Um, so what we're working on right now, um, I've got a, is this upside right? Yeah. So what we're really talking about is the area from, and I wish I had a better picture of this. I don't know. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I will be your presenter today. Thank you. I appreciate that. So that works. This works great. Thank you, Tom. So this here, this is the mill yard over here. Um, and then we're talking about the area from this section here all the way downstream. Um, we've got the uh, main street here and then all the way down just past uh, essentially uh, Sanders, uh, BAE systems. So that just showed my age. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> And the area that we're really focusing on right now is the area between the uh, Broad Street Parkway and the Main Street Bridge. That's really the area that we're focusing on. Um, and we're able to focus on that because uh, the mayor and the Board of Aldermen um, had the wherewithal to expand the original TIF district uh, to provide the funding to be able to get some of this project done. Um, back in 2016, what we ended up doing to get started was to pull together a master plan, and that involved essentially the public. Uh, we went out to the public and asked them. We did surveys. We had this really great uh, co-urbanize um, online program that we used that allowed people to really, um, in, in live time, go out and provide comments and provide specific locations. So it wasn't really just the what that they were interested in. It was the where. Um, so you can see that people had put comments, and you can go to that coerb.co slash Nashua and go through and see all of the comments that people had provided and what they thought, in their opinion, was going to be beneficial for the downtown uh, Nashua Riverfront development. So again, we used SurveyMonkey, we did a video campaign, we had 2,100 visits using that co-urbanized platform. So the area, again, that we're talking about is um, the area between the Broad Street Parkway and the Main Street Bridge. That's really what we're focusing on uh, right now. And this is part of the redevelopment plan. And you can find this on the city's website. Um, this plan was put together. It's fairly small. It's got a bunch of pictures in it. Um, and what, what we ended up coming up with was essentially we've got some cantilevered walkways. We've got uh, this area here, potential for a uh, boat launch area, small boat launch. You're not going to launch anything too big out of there. We've got some uh, fountains, some invasive species management, some trail connections that, are, that need to happen. And the things that we were thinking about when this whole plan was put together was the connectivity of all of the trails that essentially are the river walk connecting to Mine Falls and connecting to the Heritage Trail. Um, this afternoon we had a great um, grand opening, if you will, of the pedestrian bridge that cuts across the canal here, right about the intersection of Ledge Street and Central. Um, the mayor was there to do the proverbial ribbon cutting. You should cutting. check that out if you haven't seen it. It looks so really good. So that walkway is... Already been checking it out. Oh, yeah. it's but fantastic. <laughs> There you go. And, and as we were there doing the ribbon cutting, plenty of kids running in and out. It was great. So hopefully that will get a lot of use. My understanding is that the kids that, um, that go to school here are able to use that bridge. Instead of walking on the scary sidewalk, sometimes on Ledge Street, they're able to actually cut through and go around the back. So I thought that was, that was Nick had brought that up, and I wasn't aware that that was a, a, an extra benefit. Another um, benefit to people in the Mind Falls area is when kids are cutting through, if they're doing that to get to and from the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA, yeah. now they can cut through and go directly to where they're locating instead of having to walk two or three miles out of their way. So it leaves other trails that are more wilderness focused to be wilderness focused. Right, and the folks at, um, the folks at PAL are going to be able to, uh, to use that and much more effectively get into those trails um, than having to walk all the way around. Um, so we're talking about connectivity, we're talking about environmental stewardship, we're talking about better access to the river. The, Na the city of Nashua has two rivers and we can hardly see them. Um, we're talking about recreation and green space, flood resiliency, and economic development. 
So this, I think, is the highlight. I'm not sure if this is actually going to work, because I don't know if we actually have access to. Let's see. There's a YouTube video here. Ooh. Well, I guess maybe we're not going to see that. So here's the next slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, if you're interested, let me know. I probably can get you the, uh, the uh, URL for that YouTube video. It's actually kind of cool. It's a really nice um, uh, drone video that will incorporate some of the ideas in the riverfront uh, development plan. It's kind of neat. Um, but again, the overall priorities are to create that continuous river walk loop to enhance the physical connections and to do some wayfinding signage so that people know where they're going, so that they understand. The, at this point, the trail is not entirely complete. It doesn't always look the same. You might have to cross a road. And so to get some signage out there so that people know where they're supposed to be going is always a benefit. That's another overall picture, similar to what um, Vanna White is holding for us. <laughs> And this is Sarah Marchand's um, email address and phone number. If you have questions, you can feel free to call her. She is usually the one that is doing this presentation. This is a little bit new for me. Um, but some of the things that we're actually working on right now, we're working on um, returning the fountains to the Riverwalk. Um, we're working on a lighting plan so that it's not quite as creepy in some locations to be walking. Um, there is an RFP that's coming out. We should have uh, an engineer on board sometime this summer, and that person will be, uh, that company will be in charge of doing the design and engineering of some of those cantilevered walkways. Um, we're also trying to focus right now on invasive species management. One of the reasons you can't see that Nashua River is because there is so much growth in front. Um, so there will be some trees that are taken down. Some of those invasive species are so thick that they're actually killing the trees, that there is no way to remove that invasive species element without removing the trees as well. Um, but that will provide us with a better view of the, of the Nashua River. So that's some of the stuff that we're actually working on right now. If you All have right. any questions, I'm happy to take them now, or I can wait until the end. I have a quick question for you. When you mentioned invasive species, are you speaking of bittersweet, the vine? Are you speaking of? Sorry, they can't. When you're speaking of invasive species, are you speaking of the bittersweet? That is. Oh, could you, you couldn't hear? Okay. Yeah. There, bittersweet is one. Japanese knotweed is another one. Okay. Um, well, the reason I ask is because mm -hmm. bittersweet can be controlled by cutting it at the ground, but you have to keep cutting it. But it seems unfortunate nope. to cut the tree down because the vine is, is suffocating the tree. Bittersweet is here to stay. So it's I'd rather it's see true. It controlled rather than cut the trees down. And I don't necessarily disagree with you. And one of the things that we are trying to focus on from here on out is continued maintenance of, of, of the work that gets Good. done so Good. that when we do take out some of those invasive species, we don't wait, you know, 10 years and then decide we have to do it again, that it's a continual right, process. Right. Yep. Curious. All right, now, Lori Wilshire, thank you very much for coming. Lori is the president of the Board of Aldermen. Uh, thank you. Um, it's very good when the, when the members of the Board of Aldermen show up and learn about everything. So uh, what about Tom or Lori? You got anything you'd like to add at this, at this point? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Lopez, the Alderman for Ward 4. Um, so I'm pretty excited to see the Main Street, uh, the riverfront um, plans moving forward. I think in the past uh, it has come up um, early in my first term as alderman. It was uh, a proposal, but there were other neighborhood considerations at the time that we were trying to push for, like improving the lighting along the rail trail. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers when we had those little club lights going on that were flickering, but there were a lot of people that didn't feel necessarily safe walking through there. They were disruptive to the houses along the side. So um, we, we tackled that issue first, and I think the rail trail is much better lit, much safer for everybody. Um, much more appreciated. Um, but the exciting thing about the, um, the waterfront development is now it's part of a plan, um, a waterfront specific plan, but we're also allocating resources to having a citywide master plan. So failing the plan is obviously planning to fail. So actually organizing what we're going to do with resources, um, using taxpayer money as part of a larger um, focus on how to best serve the entire city, 
um, and being efficient in how we're doing it. Um, all of those are going to be results that come from having a waterfront plan, having a master plan, and integrating those planned services with other services. Um, I know there was some public discussion uh, of late about downtown parking and whether certain areas were going to have fees raised, whether other areas uh, were going to have um, additions or removals. And all of that is, again, it should be done in a step-by-step -step process that integrates um, downtown parking with the surrounding parking options. Um, one of the things that I worked on earlier in my first term was the overnight parking plan. And we finalized the what was basically a, a trial run of the overnight parking. We added a considerable number of streets to Ward 4 and the Tree Streets area um, based on neighborhood need. And we are looking at that to figure out where traffic flow patterns are, where over overnight parking needs are. And we're trying to balance that in a planned way against places that might be more rural and may not want overnight parking. Um, they may have their own parking spaces. Um, they may ha be quieter communities where they, they want to know exactly who's parking everywhere. Um, so all of this comes back to planning, um, making sure that there's prior proper planning and that we are performing as best we can with the city's resources. So those are a couple of things we've been working on. Um, and then in addition, you can put all the lights in the world on, on the rail trail or in any neighborhood, but in terms of neighborhood safety, the number one safety factor is investment in that neighborhood. So building people's feeling of ownership and engagement in the community and making people feel welcome and part of the community has always been a mainstay of making sure that that community is thriving, happy, successful, um, scoring all of those, those accolades. So we've been working very hard on that too with partners like Nashua Powell, um, with partners like NeighborWorks. Um, and so events like the Tree Streets Block Party or um, the Your Choice, Your Voice uh, voting uh, process, those build neighborhood engagement. Those make people feel like they're more part of their community. And being a welcoming community in that <laughs> manner it helps us bring to bear all of the strengths in that community. So some of them may be participation in neighborhood watches. Some of them may be volunteer support, like the Islamic Society has become a very active volunteer support. Revive Recovery Center um, has become very active in the community, participating in a lot of community events. This is how we get neighborhoods to thrive. We get people who are wanting to feel welcome, wanting to have a place in the community, wanting to feel a part of it, helping connect them and helping engage them. So those are things that we've been focusing on over the last couple of years. Uh, hopefully they've been going well. I know we had a terrific Tree Streets block party um, just last weekend. We have the Pride Festival coming up. Um, <coughs> keeping Nashua a very engaged and active place to live, making um, opportunities evident and easy to access for retired seniors, for growing families. Um, those things will make our communities better and stronger. Thank you. Right. And Lori? So Lori comes to nearly all of these, or all of them, I don't know. So that's There's really... only one I think I'm going to miss, yeah. and that's a conflict with the Board of Aldermen yeah. meeting. But thank you all for coming out tonight. As I said at one of the last meetings, we learn more from you than you do from us, because you know, you're living in, in this ward every day, you're here, you know what's going on. So I think it's important to, you know, that the mayor holds these town halls in every ward and listens to what people are experiencing in their ward. I just wanted to share a little something I learned tonight over at the police commission meeting, that the police department is undertaking a new initiative to, um, with autism awareness, and they're starting a database of people that have autism in the community so that when the police are called out, they can identify someone if that person is sensitive to touch or dogs or sirens. They'll know how to react, and it's a voluntary, um, you know, in, in enrollment thing, and they're going to be rolling that out in October. Mm -hmm. I think that just says a lot about what our police department is doing and how sensitive they are to the needs of the community, and, uh, you know, kudos to them for that. But uh, I just have to give kudos to your Ward 4 Alderman. He's wonderful. <laughs> but you already knew that. Yes. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, um... This is Cecilia. She works in the mayor's office. Thank you, Cecilia. So uh, what do you have to questions, comments? Anybody have thoughts? Yes. 
Hi. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is the right place to bring this up, and I understand there was a meeting concerning the Elm Street Middle School last week, and I missed it. I found out about it too late. So I'm here. This isn't my ward. But um, maybe you could lead me in the right direction as to um, people that I could contact to get a little bit more history on it. I'm concerned, or I'm interested in knowing um, the structural integrity. They're, they're saying that it's unsafe, and I'd like to know more about that. I think it's a beautiful school. It's, a, it's one of the masterpieces of architecture in the city, and I'm concerned about just any architect, if you did decide to renovate, that would come in and tamper with the original theme and beauty of this building. And I've heard a lot of rumors, and you know, I feel um, that some of the older buildings are surely built better than the newer ones that have mold problems and uh, generally just don't hold up as well. And so I'm wondering um, how severe the architectural integrity problems are, if there are any, and, and why the school um, really couldn't be kept as a school. And if not, and if you do decide to build a new school, I have a proposal. I think you should take it down and return it to the South Common, which is what it originally was, and give it back to the people. Well, thank you for your question. So the, the project is being analyzed by a group called the Joint Special School Building Committee, which is a creature of state law. You, this is how state law says that schools need to be built. Mm -hmm. And that's chaired by Rick Dowd, who's the alderman from Ward 2. Now, they are... Uh, they are looking carefully at both options of renovating Elm Street and replacing Elm Street with a middle school, with Elm another school down in the southwest. Right. But some of the, pro I mean, I can, since I've discussed the project with them in some detail, uh, there are issues with the Elm Street school, as you, and that's one of the things you're asking about. First of all, the, in terms of structural integrity, the floors uh, are not able, as they are currently constituted, to provide as much structural support to the building as they should. They're made out of kind of a weird material, and at times there isn't really, you know, it's just boards over kind of a frame. Mm -hmm. And so the architects are saying that no matter what they really do without spending many millions more, and we're already talking about 60 million dollars, say, uh, the building won't be as structurally sound as it should be or as a new building would be. Number two, the classrooms in their size do not meet current requirements, state requirements. So you are, the, the state regulates education and they say in order to meet state standards you need classrooms of a certain size. And these are not large enough to meet current standards. Now, we could still operate that way, but it would be out. Of, it would be not in compliance with state standard, uh, as far as. Is there the, any flexibility to the state? Standard? Well, to to completely gut the building, you know, and just tear down all of the internal walls and build a new, that would make the project much more than the you know the sixty that they're talking about, because they're talking about pretty much keeping the internal walls where they are. Another issue with Elm Street is that it is more expensive to really renovate in place than it is to build a new school because of the difficulties of handling the kids during the construction. Now, in some of the previous renovations that have been done, such as, you know, uh, I remember there were like Mount Pleasant, say, that was done when I was mayor before, and we moved the kids to the library and to the arts and what is, was then the Arts and Science Center. Or, excuse me, not the library, but the Arts and Science Center and to uh, over by um, St. Louis, there was a school over there that is now housing, and we used that structure. But with a school with a thousand kids in it, I mean, there's just no way to move the, move the kids out. That's a problem. I can understand. But can't can't uh, is, is there any option for being grandfathered in and perhaps maintaining smaller classes? Um, you know, if it doesn't meet the um, the code of today, um, why not have it grandfathered in? Unless it's truly unsound. But I, I read things in the paper like, well, there's no insulation. Well, I went to that school and I didn't suffer from the cold yes, no. and no athletic field and. You know, I'm thinking, well, the home and stadium was what they always used. And the undulating floors, I thought, is that an architectural term? Where did this come from? 
<laughs> so, but. Well, the, the, um, um, the, but two of the issues that you've pointed out, no, no fields on site, as the other middle schools have, yeah. uh, and the fact that it costs a lot more to heat the building and always will no matter what you right. do is, another thing is during the construction, uh, you, for example, there would be a lot of additional costs. It would take longer because of the kids having to be there. Number, n another issue would be the cafeteria. While the cafeteria area of the building was being renovated, there would have to be a temporary cafeteria built outside the walls, which in itself would be several million dollars. I understand that and it would have to be torn down later. So that's all being examined, but those are some of the issues. And cost will be a, a primary factor in determining which direction to go. If it becomes a white elephant mayor, would you consider returning it to the south coast? That's a possibility. I mean, I'd I mean, say... I think that would be the greatest gift. I, but I agree that the, that the architecture is, has, has value. Yes, the so auditorium. I, so I think the two obvious... The auditorium would be retained. So the two obvious choices, and this would have to be made at the time, several, you know, some, some years from now, would be, number one, convert it to, to housing, where oh. <laughs> we could have a... a uh, a conversion similar to the Franklin Street conversion, could somebody could come in and convert it to housing, or it could be returned to South Common. It did used to be a park before that was built there in 1935, right. 35, and, 36, right? And the mayor at the time, with his lack of, of wisdom, and, Who was the mayor at the time? I don't remember, but I, it was the South Common. It was taken away from the people. Yes, and with that all is the true. And they had available, they chose that to build the school. That is so true. It was sacrilege. But if they're going to um, declare the school outmoded, it would seem that the best possible use would be to re the people in that area, the kids have nowhere to play. Yeah. They have nothing. Everything is in the north end. So yeah. I'm for the uh, South Common right. restoration if you decide to move the school out of there. Well, that's certainly a possibility. And one more thing, would you consider a, a, a commission of architectural integrity for downtown Nashua that just people can't go in and do whatever they want to do? Well, we... Um, that there could be possibly a commission. That we are constrained by state law in terms of what we can do. But, we, you know, there, there is probably... Well, we have a, a, a historic district in the north end. We do have that. But I'm thinking about the downtown area. What happens yeah. to the Methodist Church, for instance? And... When we have attempted to expand the historic district, there's been opposition. Right, right. Uh, so, and those efforts have failed. So maybe, I mean, I, I think the downtown is, a, in, in reality, is a historic district. And, hope, and, and one fortunate thing we have in Nashua is that there have not been a lot of teardowns or anything, at least in the last 50 or 60 years on Main Street. The Labine building was a great loss. And the the yeah. Bean building was a loss, yes. yes. Well, I'll oh. leave room for other people to ask questions. I just wanted to yes. bring that up, and thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate it. Mayor, can I take a question? Yes, of course. Um, I know the zoning board It is worth mentioning that the zoning board particularly will have more ability to manage the traditional feel or a specific feel of a neighborhood with a better master plan, and that's one of the reasons why we've been trying to work on um, and getting one in place because, again, if you don't have a plan, then all of the commissions that we have in place don't have any way to enact or implement it. So we need to update our master plan, and that's one of the things we're working on. And part of that master plan is, is likely to be what areas should be preserved for heritage. Now, uh, going back to the riverfront master plan, this was completed a couple of years ago, and the, the point here is to, that we have this beautiful asset in the middle of the city that in the old days, we, kind of, the, we the city, kind of turned our back to it. Mills are built along the river to some degree, and there was no focus on the river. Now we think we can highlight the river by, by doing the right things along the river. Uh, again, we have this beautiful asset in the middle of the city, which we can uh, enable more people to visit, to uh, use as an attraction for the entire area, and we want to reinvest money that is generated by some of the improvements which are being made along the river, such as the mill on Franklin Street, to help pay for, for improvements, uh, river walks, lighting, the cantilevered walkways, more boat access, more more access by just regular people, by all people. So we. We really think this is a strong asset that we, 
a, a strong uh, project, a strong emphasis that we want to give over the next few years. So, yes, Sean. Speaking of water, is the river or canal safe to swim in if some young folks end up in there? Should they be not doing that? Should I be discouraging that behavior? I think the answer to that is, well, Deb can answer. Why, what, what should I tell them? You'll grow a fifth hand, or what do you do? I think the answer is yes, it should be discouraged. Because the, as I understand it, and Deb can correct this or supplement it, as I understand it, the quality of the water is, especially in the river, is, is pretty good, a B quality, a swimmable quality. But over the years, the centuries, the, the, the decades, as there were paper mills up the river, up river and mills in Nashua, a lot of things were deposited and settled on the bottom of the river. And that is, those are things that shouldn't be stirred up. So, I mean, they're, they're kind of stable where they are, and no one's for sure, um, I don't think anyone's really determined exactly the situation, but you might remember when the Broad Street Parkway was being built, there was a lot of delay regarding the, the, the boring of the piers that would hold the bridge. And the delay there was caused by the fact that DES, that's Department of Environmental Services for New Hampshire, had very carefully regulated the drilling of those holes, saying that the bottom of the river could not be stirred up. And as they got into the project and as the contractor began to have trouble accomplishing that, drilling the holes without stirring up the, 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 any sediments on the bottom, that stopped the project because they had to redesign or, or in some way rebuild what the, the, the mechanism they were using to drill, all because of DES did not want any uh, any, any, the sediment stirred up at all. The other issue, the other time that came up was when, uh, when, the, when, the, when the water was lowered to change the dam and it exposed part of the, the, the river bottom, uh, you know, they said, well, people should stay away from that. So I think the water is safe, but you, to go in, you know, you probably are on the bottom and probably not the best thing. Do my best. Yes. <laughs> what is that? Can you? I, w I would I would agree with that. I, I mean the the bottom is. I, I I kayak in there a lot. I have no problem walking into the river to get in my kayak. When we had the fountain and the future fountains, um, I have no problem with getting that water on me. But that bottom is squishy and gross. I personally I would just wouldn't touch it with my feet. <laughs> So we do have founts coming, uh, we think in j July, but maybe, but probably August, right? Two, uh, two new found, or maybe longer, I don't know. They, the last I heard was August, at the worst. Let's stick with August. Okay, August at the worst. Uh, Mayor, can I just make yes. a comment? To any children or parents of children within the sound of my voice, I just want to clarify that, in my opinion, the safest place, period, in the city, in the city to swim is where there's a lifeguard. Plus, you don't have to share your swimming space with a duck or whatever else is in the water. <laughs> yes. I'll wait for the mic. Okay. Thank you. This must be So, on West Hollis, is this on? Yes. Oh, gotcha. So, on West Hollis Street, uh, I will say between, like, uh, Ash and Vine and Palm, Really, after school hours, cars just fly by and disregard the crosswalks. Mm. So I was wondering what the city could do because I've talked to some people that live in the area. I myself have seen it and experienced it. Yeah. So I don't know if there could be an emphasis on perhaps painting the, the crosswalks or some lights or something else because there's kids around there. There's a bunch of senior citizens, just general people walking in that area. And it's a lot of cars, and I'm not sure if all those cars are necessarily from residents in the area that are flying by. 
while driving well, by. Well, you raise a good point, you know, because the uh, West Hall Street, the traffic does move pretty quickly, and people need to be safe crossing the street. We want that neighborhood to be pedestrian friendly and good for kids and residents. So we'll have to think about that a bit. You know, the I, I'm not sure just painting, the sidewalks are already painted, and paint them a little brighter. I'm not sure it would slow people down, but maybe we want to come up with some mechanism. Certainly there's police, you know, patrol, but they can't be there all the time. And maybe we want to try to think up some mechanism to try to slow people down. I mean, in some places near schools, we've erected those signs, solar powered signs that flash the speed. Uh, maybe we, and they seem to have an effect. I mean, it's hard to, you know, to exactly quantify it, but they seem to have an effect. Uh, those by, um, there's one on Manchester Street, one down East Dunstable Road, one on Dublin. And maybe we could try something like that because as you point out, uh, you know, we want traffic to be going at the maximum, the speed limit through there, not 40 or 50, 60 miles an hour, whatever it is. So we are taking that down and we will. And I would just echo that because I, like, I know they have the signs there for like crosswalk and I've almost like, I've stopped and almost gotten rear-ended by people who are like, because they, you know, the people are taking it, they're going 40 miles an hour because it's just like, it, it feels like it's a artery like to Main Street. So it's, um, it's a, that's a really good point to bring up, Paul. Now, while we have Manny, now Manny is a state rep and I, I thought I would mention something. We, the city of Nashua has, and all communities in New Hampshire have suffered over the years because the tendency, not only the tendency, the habit of the state legislature is when there are issues at the state level uh, with money, they push additional costs onto the cities and towns or require the cities and towns to pay for things that they didn't pay for before. Biggest example are city pensions. Uh, we're in the state pension system and it's uh, uh, we could talk about this for a while, but they always promised, they got the city in and all the other cities and towns by promising they'd pay 35%. They did that for a long time, but then they, then they stopped doing it. That has cost Nashua $50 million, or close to $50 million through the, through the fiscal year we're about to enter. And with $50 million, we could build a whole new junior high with cash, <laughs> uh, excuse me, middle school with cash. But this time, our state legislature, led by the Nashua delegation, has been trying to reverse that trend. And the budget passed by the House would actually return more money to Nashua than before, where before it was always going down. Uh, and what makes a lot of progress in that regard. The Senate budget is not quite as good, but it's still a lot better than we've ever seen before. And Manny, of course, is up there, and maybe you want to speak to that or sure, something that's, else that's going on? No, I, when you, before, as I got here, I was actually thinking about that because that is one of the big priorities for us is, especially with funding, um, education funding is uh, incredibly important to us, is one of our biggest priorities. So with the House budget, we would be bringing at least $12 million back to schools Specific leader national bringing things like the stabilization grants, um, returning those, and also making sure that we, um, you know, everybody gets their fair share and making a better job of um, sharing the rooms and meals taxes that um, are collected. So making sure that municipalities like ours get our fair share. Um, we are also, you know, we're trying to make an equitable budget for everybody. So, um, and Nashville is getting a bigger cut of it in the House budget. The Senate, they're both, they're working it out right now. They're going to send a budget to our governor um, and we'll see what he does with it. Um, but, you know, I think our priority is to make sure that, you know, test taxpayers that we, that you guys are getting the services that you guys require because municipalities have been getting hit hard over the last decade. Um, and it's just a lot of the, sh um, a lot of it gets shifted down to municipalities and we've heard, like we hear it all the time from people, we hear it all the time from not just Nashville but other towns. So we want to make sure that we, that we're as helpful as possible up there. Other things we're focusing on, things like uh, in our budget we want to bring back mental health um, and put some funding into that. Um, also making sure that DCYF physicians are funded. Um, that was a big priority. Um, so that's going to reach a staffing level that, uh, because their caseloads are, they're hitting like 60, 70 
uh, case like caseloads, and that's huge. Like that's incredibly unsustainable, and it, it's hard for these caseworkers who are trying their best with really difficult situations. Um, so those are some of the top priorities we have. Um, and then for us here in Nashua, we also we passed some bill a bill to hopefully bring uh, funding to for rail commuter rail so that that w that could be uh, looked into uh, in greater detail so we can give some estimates on how much it would actually cost for the city uh, for the state and um, and seeing whether or not it's feasible um, and which is something you know everyone's been talking about for a long time but we're actually hope we will see what the governor does with that bill too. Um, <laughs> But we have um, we have some really good things that are, that are going to hopefully come down uh, and help the city of Nashua. Um, so uh, just stay tuned, and we'll let y'all know what happens uh, with with whatever the governor decides. Yes. Well, why don't we give you the mic? A quick side note on the speed signs before I get to what I came for. Um, <laughs> if you do the electronic speed signs, is there any way to get this speed limit posted below them? Oh, yeah, I think yeah. they're kind of useless. Most of the ones that are out there, they show how fast you're going. They but don't they show don't, how fast you're supposed you to be going. Speed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that's the one on East Dunstable because that's the one I pass most yeah. of the time. Okay. It has the school zone 20 miles an hour. It doesn't say when this isn't flashing, how fast is the speed right. limit. Right. Right. So when it says I'm going 45 in my speed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, now you and work for the Boys and Girls Club. I'm a volunteer for the Boys, Boys and Girls Club. Boys yep. um, And that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Uh, my name is Mike Curtin, and I've been a Nashville resident for almost nine years. Uh, most of that time, I've been volunteering for the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Nashville. Um, among other responsibilities, I run the hockey program. Mm -hmm. And during the spring and summer months, we have hockey and other programs that use the outdoor street hockey court over at the end of Grand Avenue. In past years, the weather's taken a toll on the court, and it's at the point where it needs, at a minimum, to be resurf uh, resurfaced. Um, the pavement's cracking and rippling. In the spring, the club and the Nashua pal, with Sean, uh, run a weekly street hockey league for middle schools on the court, and that reaches north of probably 60 kids. In the summer, I run a weekly league, free by the way, for all the club's teens, and that reaches about 25 to 30 kids. Um, kids are really enthusiastic about it. Most of the time when I arrive, there's already a bunch of them shooting and ready to start. Um, and then also when I am at the club for other reasons, I'll see people out there playing soccer on it, playing hockey on it, um, and would really like to have a street hockey court that's in great shape and fun to play on. Um, I emailed Alderman Lopez about the court surface, and he suggested that I come here and start the conversation with you. Um, so while resurfacing the court's the minimum that's needed, I'm going to be available to discuss ways to further improve the kids' experience on the court, um, should you be able to allocate more money to it. Well, I appreciate your bringing that up. So we do need uh, better, as, better places for kids to play. I mean, there's no question about it. Now the, so that's, uh, that's on city-owned. It's not a boys' club no, thing. That, it's a city thing, That's part right? of the city park, yeah. yeah. So we will have to look at what it would cost. I mean, it's probably equivalent to a tennis court, but I'm not really it, sure. I think it used to be a tennis court. So um, we'd be glad to. I'm sure Lori is listening and Tom okay. very carefully now. So, uh, we will, so we will be looking at, we'd be glad to take a look at that and see what we can come up with. Okay. And I know they just repaved the Ledge Street basketball courts, so I don't know if it's something that could be piggybacked on that or not. Now, one interesting thing that happened, and Sean was very involved with this in the context of kids uh, play areas downtown was we ran this project which Tom already mentioned called uh, Your Voice, Your Choice. So we allocated money to the tree streets and we yep. said that uh, we would work with the neighborhood to develop projects and, and then uh, vote, the neighborhood would vote on the projects. So we developed, uh, it was 10 or 12 different projects all displayed, ultimately staff helped kind of develop and price these projects. Uh, we, div we displayed them at PAL. People came in over a couple of weeks and voted on them. And 300 and some people voted. And the thing that was chosen was, uh, was I think, someone something that no one involved was thinking that we would come up with, which was a, and tell me if I pronounce this correctly, a futsal court. Close enough. <laughs> futsal, futsal, yeah. which is a, you know, you know that. Soccer it, on pavement. It's soccer on pavement in a, in a space about the size of a 
uh, of a tennis court. So it was a great project. It came out really well. And in the end, that was what was chosen, was another play area for kids. Now soccer as opposed to, you know, uh, soccer ball as opposed to street hockey. But I'm sure that uh, the street hockey court that you're talking about has a lot of uh, love behind it. And uh, we would, you know, it's a good idea that we take a look at how to, how to re re resurface it so that it's a good playing surface. And I actually submitted that for the your choice. Unfortunately, it was outside the boundaries. Oh, it was, yes, because we, cause we <laughs> said the, uh, we did say the tree streets and technically are beyond that, I guess. Okay, we'll be glad to look at that. And I, I mean, thank you very much for doing all the work for the Boys and Girls Club because they, you are just a fantastic organization that helps so many kids and uh, relies upon people such as yourself, Coach Mike, who, uh, you know, you coach the kids and you give them a place to go and a good, a good example, a good role model. So we'd love to be able to help you out. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else? Sandy. It's not going to be about the tan, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So You're I'd not like limited to the tan, right? I know. No, well, I want to talk, but still on the, in Ward 4 up toward Fairmount Street. So okay. um, specifically Franklin Street. Yeah. When the Broad Street Parkway was um, being planned and built, there was talk that there would be a river connection from Franklin Street over to the parkway yes. and with all of these um, apartment buildings being built which are beautiful it's really nice to be able to walk on the sidewalks again on Franklin Street um, there is a lot more traffic and particularly the congestion is right at Bonhoeffer's where all of those cars park yes. on the street it's a very narrow street and that's one topic that came up at our neighborhood watch last week and um, the neighbors all talk about that. We try to avoid going down that way yes. because that intersection at Main Street and Franklin Street and Canal Street is not a true intersection. You know, it's, right. it's, it's an odd intersection. So right. one, is there still the opportunity with this riverfront project that there's going to be a crossover? And I know that's a big project um, for the traffic so that people from those neighborhoods could go th that way to get onto the parkway and the freeway versus going, everybody going down to Main Street. Well, certainly that intersection is, bec I mean, I've been a little surprised that the problems haven't been worse, actually. Um, yeah, they're you know, getting pretty bad now. Um, the yeah. offset of, the, of, of Franklin and Canal is an issue. Maybe we should look at that more carefully. I mean, more radical solutions have been suggested, mm -hmm. such as making Canal Street one way up to, like, uh, Orange. Now, but you specifically asked about the connection between Franklin and the Broad Street yeah, Parkway. That and then the parking at Bonhoeffer's. Two issues, yeah. but same street. Well, the parking at Bonhoeffer's is something that's more easily okay. at least evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, at least from my point of view, there are a couple problems with the connection to the parkway. Number one, of course, it costs probably $4 million. Number two, would we be introducing a traffic problem and making it worse in this respect. Right now, we have a lot of traffic that goes through Nashua into Hudson. And the route is principally Amherst Street to Lowell mm -hmm. to Canal to Hudson. And there is some congestion along that route. Now, Broad Street Parkway is a very direct road with no interference. Mm -hmm. If traffic from out of town could avoid Amherst Street by driving down the Broad Street Parkway, getting off a nice exit, and going to Franklin directly onto the canal. It's another route. It's another through. We're creating another through route right through a residential neighborhood. So are we creating more problems than we solve in terms of the local? So what if, you know, uh, I, I'm just making up these numbers. I'd have to really investigate how much through traffic there is. I mean, it's in the thousands. But what if, what if a thousand cars left Amherst Street and took the took the alternative, broad, you know, the Broad Street Parkway to Franklin, and reverse in the evening? Now, would that would things get better down there? They might get worse. So, yeah, and it might sort of help Amherst Street, but it could really hurt that neighborhood. Now. I think we 
are on the, I, th I think because of the changes that have occurred on Franklin, the, the new mills, the, the cotton mill before, I mean, we're, we're in a situation where we might see major improvements in the neighborhood as time goes on. You know, people upgrading their houses, mm -hmm. people moving in, new resident moved up. Oh, we're seeing, we're, we're definitely seeing that's all the good things are happening. And, and I don't know the solution. And a, and a neighborhood killer is a lot of through traffic. We do have it, people, the, so Baldwin to Fairmount is yes. a really big cut through down yes. to Franklin. So that's another one. So, you know, as if, if the city could at least look at this yes. and think about it, because then what happens the way Fairmount Street is and down to Little Florida, it's kind of a peninsula out there. Yes. And if you're looking at GPS, you can, it looks like you can cut through, but you can't because you end up at Mohawk Tannery. Yeah. Then you go around, and it's usually a problem on 4th of July, but, you know, it's becoming more of a problem now that even at my intersection at Fairmount and Hutchinson, and Carol, you see this too, cars stop and they realize they can't go anywhere because, you know, it could maybe yeah. be a dead end sign. There's, I, I'm sure there's a lot of little things right. that we can do without having too much signage. You know, you don't want Well, it would be nice to discourage everywhere. the, uh, I mean, because we want the neighborhood to be good for the people who live there and not like a bunch of people driving through, right? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, it would be interesting to look at some things on the cut-through that you just identified, mm -hmm. Baldwin to Fairmount to Franklin. There's one little Charles or wherever you mm -hmm. go there. Um, to see how, if we could discourage that cut-through to some degree. Uh, because in the end, we'd rather have the, stre the local streets for local people, not, you know, as a, as a throughway for... Yeah, and I'm not complaining. It's more, let's look at a solution because as you're filling up those apartments on Franklin Street, that's a couple hundred between that and Cotton Mill, yeah. a couple hundred new people in our neighborhood. Definitely. A lot of cars. Um, it's basically filled up at this yeah. point. But I think well, certainly we're willing to kind of, well, to try to look at the traffic issues there at Canal. And, but I do have that concern about the connection, that even if it were there, would it make things better or would it make things worse? Yeah, it lines up a little too perfect, I think. Um, Linda Harry at Gathright is here. Thank you, Linda, from Ward 9. It's very nice of you to come by. Anyone else have anything on that or anything else? Yes, Carol. Um, the paving. Right yes. It's, it's kind of a sore subject right now, but my my street has been torn up for three weeks now. And you are on uh, Fairmount. Fairmount, right. Yeah, and I don't know. So I mean, you, I have a four or five inch lip to get out yes. of my driveway. Well, we will uh, uh, check on the status. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's supposed it's to be supposed paved to be tomorrow. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Now, it does discourage <laughs> traffic. There you go. There you go. According yeah. to DPW's <laughs> Facebook page, right? Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, we should talk a little bit about the paving. At all the other board meetings, we've had a paving presentation, but since this is the sixth night, we had trouble recruiting someone from Public Works to come tonight. So uh, they've come all the other nights. But the bottom line is we're putting a lot of money into paving. 31 miles will pave this year, 25 miles last year, compared with five, six, or seven miles for many years in the past. The city has 300 miles of streets, so with five, six, seven miles, we're really on a 40, 50, 60 year replacement schedule. In addition to the 31 miles we'll be doing this year, we are going to be crack sealing another 30 miles, which is a way, a very inexpensive way to preserve a street, not for as long as it would if you repaved it, but to save it for five or six years so that it doesn't deteriorate further. Every street is ranked by a so-called PCI, Paving Condition Index. And those ratings are updated every year, at least for uh, a half to a third of the streets, because about a half to a third are reviewed every year. And the Paving Condition Index is used to decide what streets to pave. But it's not necessary, and the paving condition in index goes from zero to 100, 100 being the best. Uh, a street that's down in the 20 or 30 range really needs to be reclaimed. 
And what that means is more than what you have. I mean, it's not just taking off the top layer or the let top two or three inches mm -hmm. and then paving, paving. It is taking the street really down to nothing and rebuilding the entire roadbed and rebuilding the whole street. So there have been some streets reclaimed, but for example, Pine Hill Road last year, even though it's a, a reclaimed street, was not done last year. And the, the reason is, is that if a street is in the 40s, or say the 50s, the 60s, it can be repaved without reclaiming, and that saves the street for, for decades or 20 years or whatever, 30 years, whatever it's going to be, depending on the amount of travel. If you put all your money into the reclaiming while you're doing it's so expensive to do that. While you're doing that on a very small number of streets, there are a whole lot of other streets that are in not too bad a shape getting a lot worse. And ultimately, they need to be reclaimed. So the idea is to save as many, so to kind of do a mixture of things. Do some reclaiming, but also do some resurfacing where you don't have to, you haven't gotten yet to the point where you have to reclaim everything. So. Uh, those, that kind of strategy, and this is all sort of designed by consultants and the engineers and everything, that type of strategy plus doing the crack sealing, which we think will help to preserve streets temporarily, more temporarily, for a few years at a very limited cost. We're doing 30 miles of crack sealing for $140,000 to, to pave a, a 30 miles cost $11 million. So. So it accomplishes something in the short term that will save in the long, in the long run. So I, I think you see a lot of streets being paved. Where you see real big problems like Kinsley Street, mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason there, and I know people here, I'm sure I'll drive on Kinsley. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The reason for that is we want to make sure that all of the utility work is done in the street before it is paved, as much as we possibly can, because we don't want to put a lot of hundreds of thousands of dollars into a street and then the utility comes and digs it up in the next, you know, three months later. So in Kinsley, for example, the infrastructure is very old and very bad. So, <laughs> so there's been sewer replacement, sewer lining, there has been water replacement, there's been ga a lot of gas work. And it seemed like it was all done at, uh, come last fall and we might be able to get it done before the weather changed. But then, but then the weather was worse and we had to delay and then over the winter the gas company discovered a lot more leaks. So they needed to do a lot more work down near, there was, you've seen this, this spring, a lot of work down mi near Maine, between Elm and Maine, and uh, up, you know, maybe a block east of Elm, down in that area, because they discovered a lot of problems over the winter time. So we think it might all be done, and we are whole, keeping our fingers crossed that we can get this paved in July. But they told me it was gonna be paved last July, and here we are. So, we think we'll get it done this year, pretty soon, maybe next month. Uh, but we want to coordinate with all these utilities to make sure the money is spent wisely. Lori. And Lori's always saying, when is Kinsley Street going to get done? <laughs> I just wanted to add that the utility companies have to try to keep up with us because we've gotten into a really aggressive paving plan, and they just they, they weren't prepared for it all. So I think, you know, we have the money to do this paving now, but they didn't necessarily plan to do as much as we plan to do. So that's, I just wanted to add that. And we have persuaded them to put on additional crews, uh, overtime crew, uh, to try to try to keep up with the city's pace. And the weather hasn't been great either. Right. Well, yeah, that's been a problem. I mean, some days it's great, and then the next days it's like yeah, well, February. The fall was bad, so there was there were streets that would have ended up being paved last fall that weren't because of the rain and all that. Yes. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the <clears throat> the speeding. Um, I live just right over here, and um, I cross Lead Street all the time, yeah. and 
it's horrible. I've almost been hit multiple times. And I know um, quite a few years ago, I think they put in the, there's two speed humps right out here. Yeah. Um, and I think one is gone by now. They repaved Ludge Street a couple years back. But when they were there, they were pretty, they were pretty effective. Um, so I don't know if that's an option we can. We well, can Public provide. Works is very much against these speed bumps. Yeah. Because they yeah. say, you know, it's very hard to plow right. them and they can damage the plows and so they're very opposed uh, so that's the that's the uh, obstacle that there is to that but they have helpfully put 13 construction sites along the way as well yeah right <laughs> <laughs> the traffic on kinsley this 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 year has not been fast that's right the truth. Uh, Ledge Street is another speeding problem. We got this at a lot of different places. There's, one, there's a shady lane in the south, and there's another big one. You know, these straight streets uh, where, I mean, in a way, the, the one-way system increases the problem. I mean, that was all put in in the 60s, right? So the fact that Kinsley and West Hollis are one-way, it's more of a speedway. Two-way streets, people tend to go more slowly. The ledge is two-way. So you still got the problem, so it doesn't solve it. But we will try to take a look at Lead Street too. I mean, it, it's the same issue as West Hollis. That you know, yeah. we, you need to. We got kids going to school to the <laughs> yeah. Boys and Girls Club, right. and we want the street, the neighborhood, to be resident friendly. Not to keep circling back this, but that's also why we're pushing for the master plan. We need a comprehensive mm -hmm. plan of what makes traffic go where. Tom, mm -hmm. wait for the mic. Can we start, please? So not to keep re hammering that same point, but that's why we've been pushing for the master plan because I've been involved in at least four different traffic calming initiatives where you do one thing in one area and then the other area starts to have issues. So we need a more holistic plan. I mean, when it comes to West Hollis, there's neighborhoods on either side. That's what we're trying to avoid creating with, you know, the, um, the Franklin Street uh, entry to to the parkway and the way the traffic is, is configured, people are trying to commute onto the highway, they're facing the sun and there's people living there. We can't move the sun, we can't move people. All we can do is look at how the traffic will move and in order to do that in a way that just doesn't create another problem somewhere else, we do need to look at the whole plan. And even the commuter rail does play into that in being yet another effort of how do we how do we pull cars that don't necessarily need to be on the road because there's another way they can be traveling. Um, how do we how do we integrate that into our community and our, our resources? And that's where Manny is is so committed and so dedicated. <laughs> he just he'd like to say a few words. <laughs> He's a man of few words. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I have a mic. My name is Elaine. Oh, wait for the mic. Will Street. Um, who is responsible for maintaining bus stops? Miss, can you aim that at your face? So the question from Will Street is, who's, main, who's, who's, who's responsible right. for maintaining bus stops? Um, generally, the, the city or the transportation system, depending on what you're exactly maintaining, meaning uh, shoveling them or what? Whatever obstacle is in the, whatever obstacle is in the way. Uh, it would be the transportation system or the city would be, is responsible. And how often do they go about and make sure that they're safe to stand at? But if you have a specific bus stop you'd like us to correct, we can certainly uh, try to accomplish that. So who would I? Well, just tell us right now. Oh. <laughs> well, the two up Ledge Street. Talking to the mic, please. The two up on Ledge Street here. Which are approximately where on the cross? One is across from Davidson. Yeah. Okay, so when the bus is coming this way and it's going into the, de you know, into the depot, um, if you are coming from this direction, from, yeah, south to north, and you're going to want to stand at the bus stop. On the north side or the south side of the street? Uh, the south side street. Towards? Um, across from Davidson Land. Okay, across from okay. Davidson. So... Um, what there is is um, a very large bush, very large bush. So anyone using a walker or a cane mm -hmm. or a power chair has to get off the sidewalk onto the street and then back on again or stay in the street to All wait right. for the bus. And the bus stop 
you know, the sign you're supposed to stand at is a little too close to the bush. It's huge. And one of the problems was, um, was um, the bush was filled with bees this spring. Really? Loud enough that you could hear it. Yeah. So if you were unsuspecting and didn't hear it because you were a hearing aid, you could also have been stung. All right, well, we will definitely try to do something about that. So then the other bus stop is across the street, and it's halfway up the hill. And now which side of the street? At the Davidson side. Okay. It's halfway up the hill. Like where it's the cross street near there? Do you, do you, Simon. Can, Closer to Simon? Yeah, it's closer to Simon Street. Okay, way up there. Yeah. Okay. But there's a hill, and yeah. it's halfway up the hill, yeah. literally. So yeah. if you're you're on an incline while you're standing there waiting for the bus. Yeah. But there's several bus stops throughout Nashville that are not safe to stand at. Well, we're probably not going to be able to do anything about the incline, because that's like the hill that it's on. Um, so the move only, the bus stop. It could be moved. You know, we'd have to consider that or look at it. I mean, we might get complaints from people because it would move, wherever it moves, it's going to move further <laughs> from somebody. And uh, we might get uh, issues. Like, if it were moved to the top of the hill, of course, then people from Will Street would have to look, work, walk further, right? They'd have to go all the way down to Simon then. Because Simon is sort of at the top of the hill, right? Well, uh, nobody kind of? from, why would anyone from Will Street have to walk up that hill to that bus stop? Well, I'm just thinking they, if they wanted to go they to the bus if you eliminate the one on the hill, they could share the one at Davidson. And then they're walking down the hill. <laughs> um, well, they could, but the bus is coming in a different direction there, there, isn't it? Isn't one, isn't going it, out. Isn't one stop going out and the other stop coming in? So you'd need to take the entire route. In you'd, have to, you'd have to look at it. There's two well, we, bus we stops can, because I can't totally visualize it. So Within <laughs> spitting distance of each other. Well, we'll we'd we'll be glad to kind of check especially the bush, and we'd be glad to check out the other thing to see what, what we can come up with. And if you give Cecilia your contact information, we can try to, we'll get back to you about kind of what what's people are coming up with. All right? Elaine, right? Yes, okay. Frank. Yes, I just wanted to compliment to whoever's a, a, around the wintertime, they weren't doing a good job enforcing the no parking on the street. Yeah. They are doing that now, and they're doing a great job on that, because I'm on Walnut Street. So, so the overnight parking. The overnight, yeah. They're People who do not have permits. Right. Right. Yeah, so that was a good thing. Well, the regime changed. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So it's, it's wonderful, because there we had a lot of abusers there, and it's been taken care of. Uh, I just had a question. Um, the uh, Broad Street Apartments, where it's not the Broad, you know, Broad Street Parkway, Bronstein Apartments? The Bronstein. Yeah, yes. is, is that's the housing authority, right? Yes, that's housing authority. Is there anything going to be going on there at all? Do you know? Or? Because, well, I, because it's, it's exciting about the Walnut Street the Oval there where it looks like Penichuk is going to go there now, right? We're very optimistic yeah. that Penichuk is going to move its headquarters back from Merrimack to the Walnut Street Oval. But it's not, it needs, oh. it's going to the planning board on mm -hmm. Thursday. Mm -hmm. There's still a few things that need to be worked out, some details both with the current lease up in Merrimack and w Walnut Street, so yeah. the, the Oval. So we're very optimistic, but I can't say that it is totally, absolutely a sure thing at this okay. point. Well, that's a, it's, it's, um, it's, it's exciting, the possibility. Yeah, it is. Now, we, I want to say that the city has worked very hard to persuade Penichuk to come back to downtown. <laughs> <laughs> downtown was where Penichuk was founded, right, and was there for from the 1830s to like the 1970s or 80s. Uh, when Penichuk went, so 150 years, say. So when Penichuk became a public company, their kind of perspective on things changed, and they moved to Merrimack, and uh, we've worked very hard to try to get them to come back, and they've. Uh, they've cooperated with that, uh, you know, quite well, I think, in the end. Uh, well, we Mayor, success. if I can just add one thing, too. Yes, of course. Um, people have been asking about the Lego Mike, heads that Mike, were located. Um, I have an Envy, oh, oh, Envy mic now, oh, so I can okay. just... Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, so people have been asking about the Lego heads that were located at the Oval. Um, so a particularly oh. gifted artist slash alderman um, helped paint some, <laughs> Local some Lego politicians. heads just to decorate it. Um, and it turns out that those weren't actually planters. Those were temporary planters that were actually sewer interceptor cups. <laughs> so the city has now 
found planters and they put the planters in there. They look really good. Um, I know a lot of people have been asking about the Paul Shea head, and let's just say he'll be serving the city in another capacity. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we're, we have we have great hopes for the Oval, and we are get you know we we're hopeful, optimistic that we can get Panacek to come back to downtown. And one thing that was interesting is one force that was in our on our side is apparently Panacek polled its employees, and the assumption was well they'd like to you know they'd rather be out in the woods or whatever, but the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reaction of the employees was totally different, that they much preferred to be downtown, and that was very persuasive in terms of the Penichuk management that they would, you know, they would make a serious effort to come back downtown. So thank you to the employees. <laughs> They're all right. You know, they, they would rather walk to be able to walk places to a restaurant or just walk around town than have to drive places or just stay at their desk. All right, anything else? Well, if not, you know, we really appreciate your coming. We always, as Lori already said, we always learn a lot. We now know a little more about these bus stops, which we're going to check out. Uh, and we're going to be thinking about the speeding on West Hollis Street and, and Ledge. And the issue of Franklin Street, of course, is something we want to be thinking about as well. So thank you for coming. and. Uh, uh, anytime you have anything, don't hesitate to contact any of us. <laughs>